Welcome, it's 12.30, so um, we'll make a start to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. But um, for those of you who have not been here before, can I issue a, a very warm welcome uh, to the University of Edinburgh. If you're not from the University of Edinburgh, to the Institute of Sport, Physical Education and Health Sciences, if you're out with the Institute, to the School of Education, to colleagues and students from the University of Toronto who may be accessing this seminar, welcome to Toronto, welcome to Canada, and welcome to Dr. Simon Routh, who's our speaker for this afternoon. Simon is from, uh, from SOAS in London and is one of the UK experts on the place of sport, growing area of sport in cultural diplomacy and international relations, where most of his work over the past four or five years has been and has become increasingly interested in sport as a vehicle for that. He's going to talk to you a little bit about that this afternoon. He's done uh, quite a lot of work on Manchester United. Um, and Simon is no stranger to the University of Edinburgh. He helped the University of Edinburgh run a workshop on sport, persuasion and power in the modern world, which was part of the 2014 Commonwealth Games programme that Edinburgh contributed to. That was hosted jointly by the Institute of Sport, Physical Education and Health Science, Centre for Cultural Relations, and was funded by both the Scottish and UK government. As usual with our talks, they're about 35, 40 minutes plus, and then we simply just open up for questions from everybody. Uh, so please feel free to chip in towards the end. And the only thing to say, I think, before handing over to you, Simon, is that the title of Simon's contribution today, long title, Sport and Diplomacy, Sport and Manchester United as Cultural Diplomacy. Welcome to Edinburgh, Simon. Thank you very much, Grant. Thank you very much, everyone, for spending your Tuesday lunchtime here today. Um, it's a great pleasure, and I would like to extend my thanks to Grant for the uh, invitation and for the hospitality um, and the lovely weather that you've laid on in Edinburgh, as I understand. It's always this like this. Um, OK, I'm going to talk today about sport and diplomacy. I'm going to talk less about Manchester United than perhaps the title implies, and that's not to do with the result in Old, uh, Old Trafford last night and any sense of disappointment that you may get on my behalf as a self-confessed fan. We'll move beyond that. Um, but I will talk a little bit about Manchester United towards the end. What I've come to in this line of work that I've been uh, thinking about and working on, as Grant says, for maybe four or five years, drawing out of my work in the broader sort of understanding of diplomacy and international relations, is some of the sort of conceptualization of sport and diplomacy. And that's really the sort of bulk of where I want to get to today in terms of the, the volume of my speaking. But um, I think there are a number of questions and that's really what I want to draw out. And I'd be very interested, as this is the sort of first time I've presented it to an audience, at least in an institute of sport in some description, as opposed to amongst sort of friends within the diplomatic studies um, scholarship. So, I'm, quite, I'm very much looking forward to your feedback and your questions about where you consider the boundaries to lie and what you consider to be the sort of nexus of this conversation. And it's really that nexus that I want to talk to. It's the value that I see and the, the um, effect, efficacy of discussing sport and diplomacy together that I really want to draw out of both this conversation and the sort of broader um, research project. What I'll do is I'll begin with um, a little bit of diplomatic studies heritage. So um, I don't want to dwell too much on that, but I do want to explain some of the centrality of the nation state particularly to the discussion, not least because I want to challenge that later on. And talk to two um, angles that I've established in line with some of the other work on the subject of diplomacy of sport and sport as diplomacy. And I'll explain how they form um, something of a spectrum to discuss um, sport and diplomacy writ large. And then talk perhaps more um, specifically about sportsmen and women as diplomats and largely by deconstructing what we mean by diplomat 
and then talk about sport and non-state actors, and that's where the Manchester United case study becomes most, or most explicit. An anecdote to start with. I'm sure I wasn't alone, perhaps in this audience, in um, working at the London 2012 Games in some capacity. And I had the uh, dubious honour of having the lovely Games Maker outfit um, described to me in various guises as a pizza delivery boy um, or various others. And I shall keep it in a cupboard for a, um, a fancy dress party in you know, 20 years' time or something and whip it out then. But nevertheless, the position I had um, wasn't sort of waving people to seats or some of the more customer-focused um, position I had. The position I had was within the Department of International Relations in LOCOG, and I was a counsellor to um, someone called Greg Hartung. Greg Hartung was an Australian. He's the vice chair of the International Paralympic Committee. So for the summer of 2012, I was his, essentially his PA um, to a greater or lesser degree, including his driver, um, and one of those nice lanes across London which caused my colleagues in London such confusion. Um, but nevertheless, it was a very interesting perspective that I was able to glean from Greg, and I'll come back and talk a little bit about him later on, but it was a very... One of the first things that struck me about was how the, the language, and this is something that runs through both sport and diplomacy, the language can be conflated. So I was a counsellor because they'd looked at a, you know, the makeup of a diplomatic embassy in the Department of International Relations, said, OK, we need someone who performs the role alongside an ambassador. And that's, you know, and it wasn't necessarily a very scientific um, sort of conclusion to draw, but I was designated, my past said, counsellor to Greg Hartung. Now, all of which was, you know, provided me with lots of great insight, but there was an incident one day when we were driving into the uh, Excel Centre, which I wanted to share with you. We were driving into the secure zone, we went through um, security as we did in, to go into every venue run by um, the British Army to great effect after the Group 4 um, fiasco. And we were going through one channel and in another channel were the athletes, we went in alongside the athletes and then there was a bus, ironically from Liverpool because they shipped in buses from all over the place to um, get the uh, um, athletes around. And this bus had on it a broken window, nothing to do with Liverpool. Had a broken window, and it part, you know, we weren't concerned about it in any way, but the people on the bus were clearly quite, quite concerned. And the um, soldiers who passed us through, you know, looked through our car, we had got out, went through sort of airport side security, got back in the car, drove around to where we were I mean, parked, um, so Greg could go off and then give, a, give out a gold medal or some such. Subsequent to that, when I got back to my depot, as it were, dropped the car off, I was called into the office of my uh, line manager, who'd been, who's, his line manager was there, and it seems that that incident in the um, security zone would, would cause some kerfuffle. The people on the bus were the Russian team going into the weightlifting, and it was full of Russian athletes and Russian delegates, and they were vexed. The way that the glass had broken, as any of you who've been in a um, car, windscreen, stone flies up, looks like a bullet hole. Our Russian friends had considered it to be an attack on their bus. And whilst, you know, I might have, you know, the state of um, British-Russian relations is not great, um, sort of, and actually knowing a little bit about it, sort of laughed it off to a degree, but my line manager and his line manager were very concerned by this. It seems that one of the Russian delegates, and given that the Russian delegate on the FIFA executive, for example, is also the Russian sports minister, one can see how this uh, works in Moscow, one of the Russian delegates had rung Putin, or Putin's office. Putin had rung Cameron, Cameron had rung the head of um, the London Metropolitan Police and the head of LOCOG, and the next day, which was actually one of my voted days off, Two policemen from the London Metropolitan Office, a representative of, two representatives of the Russian Embassy, drove from central London to my house in deepest, darkest Hertfordshire, I can't afford to live in London, um, out, and interviewed me um, for about 45 minutes whilst I was looking after my two-year-old, which made for an interesting interview. And 
whilst you know the conversation was we saw nothing, there were no gunshots we heard, we didn't you know make any um, uh, sort of connotation as it were of any grander incident. What was interesting about it to reflect upon afterwards was how you know a piece of dirt, essentially a stone chipping a bus, had put into practice the diplomatic full realm of two states diplomatic practices to interview and you know a lowly councillor um, to the London uh, Olympic Committee process. And that really got me thinking, or you know, sort of brought into sharp focus some of the issues that I'm going to talk about today, about how from both the individual administrator, individual uh, actors within the international system, and the full gamut of non-state non actors to the state had been involved in that minor incident largely done for, and I was just for the public diplomacy of it, to show that the, the Russians that we were taking this incident seriously, on behalf of UK, despite the fact that there was a non-incident, if ever there was one. Anecdote number one. Anecdote number two, I'm not sure the picture's showing up great, but the picture on the bottom left, which Grant may be obscuring, is of Greg Hartung himself, inside the Olympic Stadium between sessions, um, busily on his um, supplied Samsung device. Uh, he was given three different devices, one of which was, as it were, his personal Samsung device, one of which was the one that was connected to the intranet of the uh, organizing committee, and one of which was essentially the one that he was supposed to give me to keep track of the other two. The technology worked remarkably well, it has to be said. The second picture up here is of um, the welcome ceremony for the Australian team into the Olympic Village. The lady here is the High Commissioner, whose name escapes me. But what's significant about, or what I want to illustrate in this picture, is the four flags that are here. So we have the British flag, um, the London, uh, this is for the Paralympic uh, arrival, Paralympic Games Committee, the UN flag, and the IPC flag. There were a few other instances where those four flags would be flown together. In fact, there were probably none. But the state, an, international, an event, a mega event, an international organization, and an NGO, those different interests coming together provide a new, or indeed a, something of a new lens to look at, particularly the study of diplomacy. These are not things that diplomats normally uh, focus on. So I'll talk a little now about diplomacy and what I consider diplomacy to be. I've, um, for a variety of uh, happenstance and circumstance, ended up spending most of my sort of academic career studying diplomacy in one form or another. And this is my sort of little shorthand that I have um, developed based on the work of many other scholars. Um, Jeff Berridge, who I quote here, Paul Sharp, Jan Mellison, Richard Langhorn, um, Eric Goldstein, a vast array of contemporary scholars and indeed from those from yesteryear, Nicholson and um, Springs to Mind. But I, as a shorthand, diplomacy is about communication, representation, Negotiation and agreement, even if that agreement is simply to carry on a dis negotiation or indeed to agree to disagree. And the question mark I have increasingly, and I wouldn't have had this question mark maybe 10 years ago if I'd talked about diplomacy, is about the role of the state in this regard. And I just want to dwell a little bit on the sort of um, dialogue and discourse about the centrality of um, the state uh, in what particularly my, in another, in another um, sort of corner of the forest, my colleague Alison Holmes in California and I have been working on under the aegis of global diplomacy. So the nation state is seen as, as I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, you know, any uh, international relations course you've ever done, is the sort of starting point, the foundational element of international relations and its scholarly um, endeavours. The international indicates how important the nation state is to the enterprise. As Paul Sharp, to quote, sagely notes, diplomacy in its widest sense easily becomes a synonym for international relations in general. 
And I do want to sort of utilise uh, diplomacy in a broad sense, but not in an unspecified one. And therefore, I want to dwell on sort of establishing the parameters, if I may, um, of what we're talking about here in terms of the nation state and diplomacy. Essentially, it's a contested term from which familiar. It has a number of different meanings, um, particularly sort of culturally specific ones. And despite various attempts to codify it, such as the 1933 convention in Montevideo, which attempted to define quite strictly what a nation state was, we still are pushing at the boundaries, literally, of what nation states can be made up of. So the most common features that we get to and this is sort of, again, perhaps just my shorthand for our purpose this day, is a form of political association, a defined geographic territory, a recognised population and a legitimate form of government. Now, not all of those happen all of the time, but combined with those, the, exercise, the ability to use legitimate force provides to most of us, most of the time, the identifiable characteristics of the nation-state. That is very much contested in the sort of broader international relations literature by people from a variety of different schools and not just um, our friends with sort of postmodern leanings that choose to deconstruct everything that has any meaning in other worlds. But nevertheless, it does provide some boundaries to what the nation state sets up, is set up as. And in terms of legitimate, we do raise a number of other questions about who legitimises it, and essentially it becomes that mutual respect or mutual recognition. States recognised each other. Now, when you have 192 states, as it were, as we do in the United Nations now, there is a clear um, sort of codification of that form of reciprocity, if you like. Nation states, there were far more than there were you know, 50 years ago. In 1945, there were 46 members of the United Nations. So those numbers have trebled um, or quadrupled even um, over the course of the last 70 odd years. One of the things that I find very fascinating more broadly but in the way that states behave in this regard is their capacity to mimic each other and I'll come back to that a little later in my talk. But nearly all international relations scholarship starts with uh, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 as this sort of um, starting point of the nation state. It's this sort of big bang moment. From nothing there emerged a system of sorts. Um, and that's something of a, a shorthand again, but nevertheless it does provide a sort of code and um, a guidance to international relations scholarship that sometimes goes rather unquestioned. And if we're talking about the relationship between diplomacy and sport, then it's not to say that, of course, that forms of sport took place before 1648 in the way that the forms of the state before 1648 also. And I think that's what's perhaps overlooked in lots of the sort of broader literature when talking about sovereignty, which is where we get, which is the sort of net output of this 90, uh, 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, of which there are two, of course, which obviously gets overlooked in the literature as well. From that, and when we're talking about sovereignty, we're also talking about power. And it's the sort of logical consequence of talking about sovereignty. You can have sovereignty over, you know, I have a degree of sovereignty over this space because I'm the one sat here at the front or stood here at the front talking an exercise of power of sorts. George Shultz, the former US Secretary of State, quoted in his memoirs that power and diplomacy work together. And I've... I, whilst I sort of admire the uh, tenet of that, I'm not sure I can agree wholeheartedly. I think a more nuanced approach looks at the relationship between these two um, elements on a sort of contextual basis. And that's what I really want to push on to now. Power in the realm of uh, sport it can be manifested in many different ways. But is the power over territory, people, that is often seen as most obvious. Hans Morgenthau, the sort of doyen of realism in um, international relations scholarship, wrote that international politics, like all politics, is a struggle for power. Whatever the aims of international politics, power is always the immediate aim. And here's some qualification on what I mean by sport and power and politics, 
and sport and diplomacy. So when I talk about politics, I talk about the message, or I'm referring to the sort of message that's being conveyed, the, um, whatever that may be. When I'm talking about diplomacy, I'm talking much more about the messenger, the form of that message. Now, they're not distinct, utterly, but what politics, the message, sorry, uh, yeah, the message, and diplomacy, the means of, that mes of conveying that message. As Nicholson stated, one of the um, founding fathers of uh, diplomacy or diplomatic studies in the first decades of the 20th century, said, diplomacy is neither invention nor the pastime of some particular political system, but it is an essential element in any reasonable relation between man and man, between nation and nation. In following Nicholson's thinking, diplomacy therefore entails any reasonable relation short of war, of which international sporting competition is just one example. There is a cognitive dissonance here, though. Another founding scholar, Herbert Butterfield, wrote, diplomacy may include anything short of actual war. But one can identify a meaningful parallel if you look at George Orwell's remarks. Sport is war minus the shooting. There's a sort of gap here. And that's what I think really this sort of uh, establishes one of the sort of forms of parameters, perhaps on sort of the x-axis, if you like, of what I wanted to talk about. Very few people would tell you that, or would start uh, in the realm of sport, be that politicians or indeed athletes or administrators would say that sport and politics mix. They're forever saying sport and politics don't mix. But actually, I'm sure to this audience, we know that's not necessarily the case. So that reflects two things. One, to paraphrase Clausewitz, sport is a continuation of politics by other means. And that diplomacy is an art that is routinely overlooked. And that's where I want to make a contribution in the work that I've been doing. And I like to think in my sort of more ebullient moments that I am perhaps. So these are some of the questions. And before we dwell too much on answers, I'm not going to go through and provide answers to these today. Each of those I think would take you know, a full seminar, if not multiple seminars, discourse, articles in and their own right. But I do think they help provide the sort of some more of the parameters to what we're talking about here. Simple question to start with, if you like. What role does it play, does sport play? How does sport relate to other forms of diplomacy? Diplomacy is one that has been, you know, and I think unfairly used with many different prefixes. Cultural diplomacy has a long heritage um, and where the boundaries of that particular field lie. You know, we have the Centre for Cultural Relations here at the University of Edinburgh, which may have been called the Centre for um, Cultural Diplomacy, um, had, you know, some senses the brakes fall on the other way. Public diplomacy. Public diplomacy is very much in vogue in diplomatic studies um, terminology, if you like. If you want to get a paper published or a paper accepted onto a conference, Public diplomacy in the title stands a higher chart. Old traditional diplomacy, no, no. Public diplomacy, far more the sort of, uh, a little bit of the emperor's new clothes in my humble opinion, but nevertheless does form a, a distinct body of work, particularly informed by colleagues in media and communications who are using it in terms of nation branding and the like. The question of gender is not something I would want to overlook in this discussion. Diplomacy and sports, if nothing else, have a common um, misrepresentation of female uh, athletes, administrators. I was reprimanded by my colleague in the Centre for Gender Studies the other day for not saying there was an underrepresentation of women within um, FIFA's executive, but an overrepresentation of men. The idea of um, the global media and sport is an angle that um, has not been necessarily fully thought out in relation to the diplomacy that it conducts. The relationship between individual sports clubs, individual um, leagues and what have you, and the sports and the, the media deals they conduct. So the Premier League, as by one example, its domestic TV deals, well, 
two weeks ago for five and a half billion um, pounds. The foreign deal requires a whole different range of negotiating um, skills. Now you're no longer dealing with just BT and Sky. You're dealing with a huge variety of culturally specific television, in that case television deals, within a whole another um, orbit of um, organisation and um, financial consideration, many of whom are, have relationships between themselves that transcend this relationship between this a purely transactional one between you know, a, a brand like the Premier League and signing a deal in Italy or the United States or what have you. I think that, well, that also brings us back to, and going back to my sort of anecdote about um, the, the Russian uh, incident, this whole level of analysis question. There seems to me a lot of literature, or a good deal of literature, and this focuses very much on the case study basis of either an intervention on behalf of an NGO, a government, a sports federation, or indeed on behalf of an individual or group of athletes who transcend some form of boundary and become recognised within an international realm, and not just necessarily for their sporting prowess, but have a bigger message to convey, and that's where the diplomacy kicks in. What I think strikes me about this is, is there's very little that looks at the, uh, at least more than maybe one or two levels of analysis, whatever those levels are. So you're talking from the international organisation to the state, the state to the regional organisation within any particular country, links between regional organisations that transcend the national boundary. And this is where that question mark arises in the role of the state, quite clearly. I think there's clearly an issue about identities. I'm thinking here of sort of Castell's work on multiple identities, resistance identities, and how one can construct and have uh, identities constructed for you within a sporting realm, not least because, again, you're in a very exclusive um, group of individuals in many regards, particularly sportsmen and women. And again, there's a parallel between diplomats. You know, the tranche of the population in any given place who are elite sports people and the tranche of people who are diplomats very small, very self-contained in many regards. I suppose this is where I end up with my larger question about the role of diplomacy without the state. And this very much reflects a uh, discussion within uh, international relations broadly, sort of small i, small r, but particularly the diplomatic studies field. Some answers of sorts then. If I'm not going to answer these specific questions with any great depth today, what I will try and do is provide something along the sort of y-axis of my focus. Sport as diplomacy. So going back to my sport is, oh sorry, diplomacy is slide. This is the negotiation and agreement. This very much builds on the work of um, Stuart Murray and Jeff Pigman, who I've uh, worked with in the last uh, three or four years, and looks at sport as a means of conducting and facilitating diplomacy diplomacy and providing a venue or opportunity for high-level state-based diplomacy. So this is still quite state-centric way of looking at diplomacy. Sport is something of a, uh, is analogous in this regard and you're talking about negotiating agreement. An agreement must be reached in sport on the rules of the game. The parallels just in, in as, a, uh, as a minor side as it were, but the Diplomats regularly say we need to establish the rules of the game. You know, the number of memoirs that have that rather trite line, because we need to establish where, you know, the size of the field, the length of the race, the time of the event. These are all things that, you know, we know, well, barring the intervention of football, uh, sorry, of television, football kicks off at three o'clock on a Saturday. Well, at some point that was a negotiated agreement. We can find this, you know, the sort of historical ground of it. But in each of these cases, you know, the size of the pitch, the length of time, the cycle in which things happen has been a form of negotiation and is ongoing. You know, in terms of changing the rules of any particular sport, changing the rules of any particular um, event, there's always a negotiation that goes on. And negotiation being at the heart of what the uh, diplomatic en enterprise is about. Of course, there's particular British heritage to many sporting federations and many the origins of many sports, which I wouldn't need to sort of dwell on here. But there's an important sort of counter-imperial story 
here. And the use of um, what Joseph Nyes and many of you will be familiar with, sort of soft power ideas here, in how that can influence and shape the centre, if you want to use a sort of core periphery idea. And again, there's a parallel between that and the practice of diplomacy. In the 350 odd years it took to get to something called the Vienna Conventions in the early 1960s on diplomatic and consular uh, services. There's a long time it takes to develop and adhere to practice and regulation, governance, good governance, if you like, that you want to talk about. Sporting federations negotiate with each other as well. They negotiate with each other for the timetabling of events. Can't have the World Cup in February 2022 because it might conflict with the Super Bowl or the Winter Olympics, for example. So there's a negotiation process there that, in many regards, is absent from the state, but actually it does involve the state to, to a greater or lesser extent. In that instance, perhaps less so, but nevertheless, those are events within an international calendar that are fixed with a degree of acquiescence, if nothing else, on behalf of nation states. I'm going to turn to the diplomacy of sport. And here I'm on perhaps less firm ground in many regards. This is much more about the sort of symbolic aspect and much more, the, much more about the message. Sport can be used to begin or continue or enhance diplomatic relations. The example of Nixon uh, visiting China provides the sort of archetypal instance of ping pong diplomacy. The back and the forth, the ping and the pong of diplomacy. But sport can mark sea changes in other diplomatic um, realms of international affairs. So in the uh, Mandela's um, appearance at the World Cup final in 1995, wearing the Springbok shirt was clearly a message to a domestic audience about uniting South Africa, but it also has an important international message also about what South Africa is as a united nation, rainbow nation in that instance. But we also know that sport and sporting events can be hijacked um, quite literally for less um, well-meaning instances. So the 1972 uh, Munich Olympics springs to mind in that regard. And in that sense, the diplomacy of sport predominates over sport as diplomacy in providing an opportunity for both summit diplomacy, if you like, it's, it's summitry of, of its day, and as a single event, that mega event, the city-wide or nation, nationwide opportunity for um, the sporting um, occasion to continue that, that um, conversation. And if, if here you're talking about... Um, Diplomacy, the sort of Gucciardini, Gucciardini, one of the sort of Italian Renaissance scholars who talks about diplomacy, written, wrote loads about that and indeed many other things, talks about the right moment for diplomacy. Diplomacy should only happen at the right moment. Now, what he meant by that in the context of Italian city-states in the mid-15th, 16th century is something very different from perhaps what we might talk about now. But nevertheless, talking about utilising deadlines, finding the opportunity to get the greatest advantage for your national, city, state interest. On the other hand, you have Richelieu, the first real um, foreign minister, if you like, who sets up the French foreign ministry and diplomatic establishment of which everyone else follows in the 16th, 17th century. Now, Richelieu talks about négociation continuelle. It's all about the continual process of negotiation. There is no right moment. And these two are often set up as sort of... Um, you know, extreme views of what diplomacy entails. And it's somewhat constructed because actually there's a little bit more common ground than that little pen picture indicates. But nevertheless, there is a space there between the negotiation continuelle and the ripe moment. And the Olympic mega event every four years and the week to week or um, fixture list provides further opportunities for conduct of diplomacy. Also worth mentioning here is the literature that's being developed on you know, city diplomacy. So one of the things that defines that is the mega sporting event. 
work of Michaela Akuta and my colleague over the road in, at UCL in London. They've been doing a great deal on what it takes to conduct diplomacy on behalf of a city. So having a mayor, that helps. Having those big events, that helps. Being the financial centre, all of those kind of transport hub, all of which are the things that actually you look for in bidding documents when you're talking about hosting Olympics, World Cups, etc., etc. Okay. A little as sports people as di diplomats. This is a picture of Ali Gagarin, so named because he was such a, his rise was so meteoric in Sudanese football that he was likened to Yuri Gagarin. Uh, he's also, there are, very, there are a few other examples, someone who went from a sporting career literally into being an ambassador. You know, the, the pinnacle of sporting achievement within his country to being an ambassador for his country. He was ambassador to the Oman and Central African Republic. And I'm duly um, deferential to uh, Joseph Wilson, the um, uh, journalist, for pointing me in the direction of this case. It's a very um, symbolic role in that regard. And this is where there are relatively few other people who have chosen this both or had it had you know, the circumstance arise where they could have chosen this um, opportunity. But what it does allude to is the role of, and perhaps this is where we're questioning the, the diplomat here and the role of the state in accrediting the diplomat, the increasing role of unofficial diplomats. Now, the um, mindful of that I crossed the border at Berwick, the English FA um, or the English World Cup bid 2018, had three ambassadors, three main ambassadors, one of which was the Prime Minister, okay, sort of obvious, one of which was the future monarch, kind of Prince William, which is again kind of obvious, and the third one was David Beckham, I've got four fingers, three fingers, the third one was David Beckham. Now, David Beckham actually has ambassadorial status according to the UN as well, and was, didn't re receive credentials in the way that ambassadors do, and didn't have to present them to um, other heads of state, but did have ambassadorial status according to FIFA. So he was accredited by an international organisation within a specific context under a specific circumstance. But that is something that diplomats took 300 years to get codified in the Vienna Conventions. I just want to quote from a colleague of mine, Giles Scott Smith, who's doing quite a lot of work on private diplomacy, the diplomacy conducted by private individuals away from the state, not least because that actually can provide quite a lot of room for manoeuvre for the state, provides a sort of um, orientalist othering of the state, and you can achieve state aims by the private individuals. Once the frame of diplomacy is altered, Giles writes, so the kinds of actors who become visible with it change, and the designations, diplomat, become more fluid. And so here you're into a whole realm of celebrity diplomat, guerrilla diplomat, and unofficial diplomats of all sorts, who are working to a degree in line with or in parallel with national state-based interests, but also within their own perhaps commercial um, interests as well. I won't dwell on the Beckhams, but uh, Victoria is also a UN ambassador in terms of uh, her work for UNICEF. Now, they clearly have an agenda which you know, I'm sure has been discussed in these halls about uh, the Beckhams as a brand, as a nation, but that they have, both have official accreditation from the preeminent international organisation is not without significance. This Having sort of highlighted the question at the outset, what this does tend to, though, is to leave to or, or focus on the sort of case study analysis of individuals, the Beckhams, Ali Gagarin, um, other um, people, Nolan Ryan, famous um, American bit baseball pitcher, has been um, co-opted, perhaps too strong a word, has agreed to be a sports ambassador for the State Department in the United States. Um, and there are other individuals um, who've performed this role. But I do think it raises some questions and I haven't quite got to any particular answers as it were as to the sort of commonality of their experience, 
what they bring to being diplomats. And in that sense, the, the diplomatic centre are quite keen to bring people who have broader skill base to, the be to bear. But equally, that distance. You know, what happens when they you know, perhaps speak out of turn, when they have an opinion which doesn't align to um, the national uh, view? These are perhaps examples of diplomats to an extent. This first quote here, boots instead of briefcases, but diplomats still, um, was in an article or a, a, a um, sort of travelogue that accompanied the England World Cup team to the 1950 World Cup. And the second quote is from uh, Daniel Taylor, the journalist, as England prepared for um, World Cup qualifiers sorry, the Euro, to, Euro 2012 tournament in the beginning of, um, well, the summer of 2012. Both of them aligning England players as diplomats. The 2012 one came about as a lot of the uh, John Terry, aftermath of John Terry, how could he be England captain and diplomat? But also, I think, whilst these other examples, and I think the Eddie the Eagle Edward ones is not without significance. It doesn't mean you, to be an ambassador, you don't have to be at the pinnacle of your sport as he certainly was not, although he was at the pinnacle of that lamp, um, you don't have to be at the pinnacle of your sport to be performing this role. But I think also the administrative, the administrators are important here. They have perhaps the skill set that's most aligned to conventional diplomacy, conventional forms of diplomacy. And that's something that we need to just take a step back. So Jacques Rogg you know, was made uh, an ambassador to the UN a special representative by the UN Secretary General for um, the precise title Youth and um, Development. Greg Hartung, as I've mentioned, has ambassadorial role now is for ANU University, Australian National University. A little about sports clubs as non-state actors. I will get to Manchester United in a minute. But also about the federations. There's a particular brand of sports clubs. Real Madrid, All Blacks, Barcelona, New York Yankees, Dallas Cowboys, LA Lakers. You can probably add half a dozen others. But there are a finite number of them. There's not every Premier League club, not every NFL club, not every baseball team. And they can perform specific role, and I'll talk about that a little more in a moment. But they're perhaps a, a degree of social actor because the consumers of those products have a social relationship with them. Whether they manifest that through you know, knowing people is not so much matter, but the sort of Twitter following, Facebook alignment, brand opportunities, all provide a means of a social engagement. And if one takes a sort of an expanded meaning of non-state actor away from its just anything that isn't a state in sort of reductive fashion, I think this is perhaps something that is still sort of playing out as to where these people fit into the panoply of international affairs. And sort of two examples here, the FIFA and the United Nations and the IOC, both of which have pretty unique status within the United Nations family. The United Nations family is massive, it contains numerous um, agencies, funds, um, different um, sort of bodies within it. The, you know, and the Secretary General is far more secretary than it is general, to take my UN class. But since 1999, there's been an official agreement between the UN and FIFA. And FIFA has worked through, for all of its faults over the past 15, 20 years, worked through with various UN agencies to provide, you know, sort of for the game, for the world idea. The UN and the IOC, and which I think is perhaps a more interesting example, have a number of working relationships. Given observer status in 1999, that's quite a, it's the only non-state body to have status within the United Nations General Assembly. So every year when the General Assembly arrives in New York, you know, mid-August through to mid-September, the IOC are there. What influence they have, you know, we can have a discussion about that. But 
according to Ban Ki-moon, in one of the, well, the few things he said of any meaning, Olympic principles are the United Nations principles. Well, that's all well and good, but the IOC is not without its faults. And certainly in 1999, was not without its controversies in the aftermath of the Salt Lake City scandal. Now, again, there may be greater levels of expertise in the room, but the IOC does seem to have got its house in order over the past 15 years, give or take, to a degree that you cannot say about FIFA to any um, great extent. But this, there's a, a resolution, which I think is worth pondering on at the end of uh, November, or beginning of November 2014, about talking about the IOC and the UN working together post the MDG. So the Millennium Development Goals, which are due to finish in 2015, to varying degrees of success, talking about a relationship between the IOC as a means, as a vehicle of moving those forward into the future. I get to the Manchester United. I make the point, there was a, a small realm of, of sports clubs that I believe can operate as, no one operates independently, as a quasi-independent actor in diplomacy. These are pictures taken from a 2011 tour that, the, that United undertook to the United States. So, having just been chastened by Barcelona at Wembley, they got on plane and went to the United States for a three-week tour across the nation. Entirely logical in terms, you know, for um, their commercial interests, owned by Americans, sponsored by Americans, shirts made by Americans, you know, even more you know, um, process now. And in commercial terms, if you spoke to the commercial director, a great success in terms of upping with the kit deal, the sponsorship deal, and the um, training ground, the sponsorship of the training ground, all with major American, or well, two, two major American companies, Chevrolet and Aon, and the um, sh sh kit deal. You don't want to mess up kit and shirt, just um, kit deal as being uh, trumped, you know, Adidas trumped Nike um, by virtue of that, or, you know, the, the processes involved there. But what you have in this picture particularly is ambassador, Sir Bobby Charlton is an ambassador of Manchester United, Ferguson is now an ambassador of Manchester United talking to an ambassador of the UK state. This is Sir Nigel Scheimold, he was the ambassador at the time um, in Washington, the British ambassador. He was formerly Blair's um, European uh, advisor, helped get the, Iranian, uh, the Royal Navy um, seamen out of um, Iran um, circa 2004. Um, very experienced diplomat. The, a number of things happened on that instance that, that, that day when they went to the embassy, which is where the uh, picture on the right hand side is, and when they, or the squad en masse went to the White House. Um, they were supposed to have an audience with Obama, but um, something more important came up. Um, but it was scheduled and it was a sh short notice thing, so it was a, an opportunity. And, and, you know, American presidents regularly have meetings with successful sports teams. It's one of their public diplomacy opportunities. You know, the, whoever the World Series champions, whoever the NFL champions, have an audience with the president of the time. What I think this illustrates, and, and what Scheinwald did quite neatly, just as an example, is talk to both the, the sort of confluence of a club's interests and that of the, of the state. He organised... Um, an event, and the, the children you see here um, are from one of Washington's less salubrious suburbs, of which there are many. The embassy has a relationship with a number of organisations on the ground in Washington um, to do you know, sort of local self-help kind of work, if you like, work in the community. It's CSR kind of idea. The idea that the Scheinwald had was to have an event on the lawn of which there is quite a lot outside the British Embassy. It's one of the more plush embassies that you know, the HMG own. Um, I would thoroughly recommend the visit if you ever have the opportunity. Where they had a, f a football clinic. You know, so he invites all the kids from the ghettos, or a number of the kids, not all of them, from the ghetto to play football with Wayne Rooney and Michael Owen and um, Ryan Giggs, um, a few other of the players who are there for that event. Now, 
wonderful experience for those children who have to go back to you know, perhaps difficult circumstances at home. A good photo opportunity, if you like, to say, show how the British Embassy in uh, Washington is um, helping its local community. But also, what is, uh, you know, Shalimald's motivation in, in extending the invitation, it was an invitation extended by the Embassy to the football club, not engineered the other way around, was that he, he invited his staff, you know, largely you know, but not exclusively British staff, to engage with a British institution. Importantly also, in the latter half of the day, he invited all of the rest of the diplomatic corps. So of which there are in Washington nigh on 150, 175 different other embassies. So he invited all of the ambassadors, and importantly all of their wives and their children, to come and play football with Manchester United on the lawn outside the embassy on a nice summer's day in Washington before it gets too hot and turns into a swamp again, which it does in July and August. That, Shaima will tell you, as I've written up, was a particularly successful event at pushing British, British public diplomacy across the Washington diplomatic corps. Because if you're, just from the kid's point of view, if you're, your dad's the ambassador to this or that or the other, and you've been to 15 different international schools over your entire academic, you know, sort of childhood, from here to there, someone comes and picks you up to the school, da -da. the most important, or the, one of the most things that will resonate with you about the time in Washington was not that you met President Obama necessarily, but was that you played football with Wayne Rooney. And you know, the, the significance of that further down the line, you know, might be turned out to be Prime Minister, but the opportunity or the influence that has within you know, sort of domestic psychology situation can be quite insignificant. But also, Shimer will tell you that that actually gave that that event was attended by more other ambassadors than any other event he held in the four years he was ambassador. You know, more than his his sort of inaugural, more than visits of the Queen, more people turned up to see this for the. Now that might just have been because it was convenient, all lots of circumstantial facts, but I do think it illustrates there's an influence here. I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is another one of those questions that we need to be wary of. This is um, discussion of public diplomacy. I've been doing some work with the British Council here. And what I'm most interested in is the sort of relationship between the UK state, the British Council, the Premier League, football clubs other than Manchester United, and other sports in the UK and elsewhere. Talking about a very uh, sort of multifarious group of actors within the international system, nevertheless providing a certain public diplomacy, a certain message to an audience that is not another state. And it's not just the fans if, you know, who might get up at four o'clock in the morning to watch a, a game in Singapore or what have you. There are other um, interests at work here. And this really, this sort of full level of analysis or the range of analysis here, the levels at which this is happening, the relationships between them individually and across the whole piece really haven't come to certainly scholarly attention within the diplomatic system as yet, within diplomatic studies for given. So, the diplomatic influence. I think there's a good deal to say here about the language of sport and diplomacy beyond just the sort of commandeering of phrases. It's about the message in that regard. I do think sport can have an influence on diplomacy in a unique fashion in the way that business, other forms of the arts, um, even military conflict doesn't. And diplomacy does influence the conduct of sport. Those uh, individuals who have positions of power within international organisations are as susceptible to um, the photo opportunity with sports men and women and indeed with sports administrators as any of our local politicians are. And we shouldn't overlook that. Thank you and questions. Thank you very much, Sam. Yeah.
up on the floor for a short period of time in terms of uh, questions to be asked of our, our speaker. Sharon, you want to kick us off? I'll kick us off. Yeah. As many of my students know, um, I'm not an advocate of football, um, so it's the paradox, paradoxical situation in your last, very last point there, that football has such global power, and all our students know the power of um, football, over and above other sports, which are better examples of good practice within governance, within business ethics, within corporate social responsibility. Um, you know, football's poor behaviour from players spitting and biting each other through to the fans. Um, we've had decades of homophobia, racism, sexism, and all of this has continually reinforced within the sport of football. Um, and there are some, you know, anti-racism campaigns, all the things that our students know about in terms of trying to provide some resistance and leadership against that. But it's still very paradoxical that some of the best behaved sports right the way through from their strategic objectives through to the behaviours that they influence um, and their values, is that they are so underrepresented. Um, potentially there, I mean, I know there are female um, diplomats, because I've met some of them at Glasgow 2014, but, you know, this kind of, the male diplomat and his wife and their children who come along and they promote the, the colonialisation and and the imperialism of sport, um, but the worst of all sports, which for me is a paradox. I mean, I don't think you're wrong in identifying the you know, global hermit of football, and it's certainly not without its faults. I think one of the things that strikes me about this is the, the season, the, um, uh, the fact that you have another game every four or five days a week gives you a chance to reset the narrative to a degree that other sports don't because of the profile it's given. So the, the, I was in was it two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the Chelsea fans on the tube in Paris who displayed some particularly disgraceful language. The next day I was meeting with, um, forgive the related name drop, um, Tim Vine at the Premier League. Now he spent a good deal of his morning thinking or in, to, in a couple of meetings with this, not least talking to Chelsea, talking to UEFA. But the, the best thing that he could come you know, in conversation afterwards was they've got another game on Friday from Saturday. You know, that's happened, I can't address that now. What they should be doing to deal with it in the first place, we can have another conversation about. But the response at that point, and as a director of communications, that's perhaps his job, is thinking about moving the narrative on. And that's it, there's no different from other forms of you know, political story making that you know, politicians are particularly um, sort of trying to. But I did think it sort of resonated with the sort of grand narrative of having the regularity of the event. Yes, it's highly, you know, gets a disproportionate level of profile, particularly in you know, northern um, European countries. But actually having the ability to move the narrative on all the time, despite all of the problems with it, is quite a remarkable feature of football bit large. And for all of the faults of all of the governing bodies um, at various levels, so be that um, you know, even sort of regional levels of, of the Football Association in the United well, in England, forgive me, um, the, um, the FA at large and the national level, UEFA, actually the ability to move the narrative on, and it might just be you know we're being hoodwinked the entire time. I'm quite happy to you know guilty as charged in that, but, you know, just as an individual. But I do think it actually makes you think about what it takes to move that story along all the time. It's the, uh, I'm far more in the sort of broader sense um, the, uh, a fan of the sort of cock-up theory of history rather than the conspiracy. Conspiracy is too difficult to maintain. It's too costly in itself that the problems are things that we can cover up and, make, and then sort of build an alternative narrative. They have to be part of the other narrative. There's, there's only one um, football. There's another, an alternative Premier League where you know, people are hugely respectful of referees, for example, or hugely respectful of each other. I think that, I haven't got my, I've got my head fully around it, but I do think it's an important part of 
just moving the story on. You know that it's sat there at three o'clock, it's subject to the sky, um, there's another match. And that's their sort of saving grace, that you can do something on the pitch that will transcend and people will forget, even if it's only for 90 minutes. Whether they should forget or not, or is another matter. But I, you know, I take the point, there are far better examples of, of sport that we could use to you know, educate. And that's where you know, the, the, you know, the discourse around the extent to which the IOC should, or the UN and the IOC should be in bed together. I think it is worth on because there are other sports there that you know, the UN can profile to a degree that aren't football. And I find the UN's relationship with FIFA, and the UN does to a degree, find it particularly problematic because you know, FIFA particularly amongst all of the governing bodies of international sport in my estimation is the most problematic. And yet it would tell you, you know, all of its funds are ploughed back into grassroots foot. Once you've taken out the cut from everyone else. No. Cheers, Simon. Thanks again. Um, it's kind of related a bit to what Sharon's saying. Um, it, I'm quite intrigued to even know that Matt and you even had programs in Washington, basically. We, we always do think, basically, that their sort of outreach ex extends to the you know, likes of Southeast Asia and the such, basically. But that, that, that's quite interesting that you even had a community program there, too. And it, it's, it's probably the number one problematic question whenever it comes to anything on, on, the, on the development side, basically. If, if you're working class, or, or, or even below working class and living in Washington, is soccer the thing you need? That's, the, that's probably the main sort of problematic thing, obviously, with regard to, because if you think you're right, basically, it is a form of diplomacy, basically. But there, there are obviously more sort of important things going on than do we necessarily need a program that might encourage you, encourage you to you know, risk, risk it all for sport? And probably in the case of Washington as well, it would, is even soccer the biggest sport? You know, Wayne Rooney is going to be well recognized, obviously. But um, how, how, do, how are their sort, of, uh, their sort of programs compared to, say, lo the local basketball team? Yeah. And what the, obviously their diplomacy as well is quite big nowadays as well. Yeah. I think one of the, the you know, the, uh, forgive me if I, I misspoke, but the relationship between the community and Washington was on behalf of the embassy. So yeah, Manchester yeah, United yeah. were sort of yeah. doubling up or piggybacking and vice versa on, on, on that regard. I think the, you know, the question you have in, in sort of developmental or in, in the realm of development is an interesting one. Yeah, you know, the um, local, you know, sports, you know, the Manchester United Foundation does a lot of work in Salford, you know, in its very immediate locale. But what's interesting about that, or you know, one of the more interesting developments is that they're expanding that so you can take a Manchester United Foundation, which is their sort of development arm, and, in, um, and I'm loath to say deposit, but um, see its manifestation in you know, work in Jakarta, for example, is where they're, they're, they're current focus. They have a project to work with local communities in Jakarta. Now, there's a form of, you know, particularly from my institutional background, the sort of ever ready thought I have to have in mind is, you know, um, cultural neo-colonialism neo, uh, um, has to be borne in mind. But nevertheless, you know, perhaps for the individuals involved, there's a developmental opportunity there. In the case of Washington, yeah, the um, MBA has a, you know, serious CSR kind of program and will work in, you know, the ghettos of Washington, of which there are many, and the other, you know, major American conurbations to a degree that um, you won't get in middle class suburbs. Um, clearly, so I think the um, I think one of the opportunities that soccer has in the American market is because it's still quite new, relatively, and it has an inter greater international film. There is an opportunity to, for more diplomacy to be involved around it, whereas the uniquely American sports, and they're not uniquely American, but uniquely focused American sports, don't have that opportunity to have international partners. It's why Yao Ming and the NBA was such a big thing in every sense of the word, um, because it has a, an opportunity for that outreach. And that's where that sort of public diplomacy message becomes very, very clear. You know, the coordination between the NBA and the State Department and what the message is to, you know, Beijing, mm -hmm. very, you know, th that's tied up. Um, you know, the, the relationship between, you know, um, other NBA players and where they're from in you know, Michigan or 
Idaho, you know, not e even within the sort of national politics of the United States, far less of an interest, you know, far less of that public diplomacy message. There's five players from Idaho in the NBA. Brilliant, I don't know, but you know, that message is not one that needs to be um, resonated in comparison to all of the other messages that the NBA wants to get, not least of which is, can we have some of your dollars, please? You know, and these are the, you know, the explicit commercial interests of these organisations you know, has to be borne in mind. In that sense, what I'm looking at in terms of the diplomacy is only ever marginal. Well, not only ever minor, but largely marginal most of the time, and become to the fore at particular points in, you know, either a sporting cycle, an event type cycle, or because of a particular instance. And that's where it can go the other way. You know, if the um, if those Manchester United players had at the end on an end of season tour been out on a social event, and you know, some of the untoward activities that um, sportsmen have been known, and indeed sportswomen have been known to get up to, um, had become red top or, you know, headlines, mm. then your diplomatic message becomes slightly different. You know, that's when, you know, so it works both ways um, in that regard. And, you know, in that instance, there wasn't any um, sort of negative or, you know, particularly negative connotations. But that's the sort of risk that you always have to bear in mind between when you put sportsmen and, um, uh, or the, the politician in that sense has to put them together because it can work the other way quite effective. Sportsmen have been known to make mistakes in their personal lives which have had, you know, taken up a great deal of media column inches and the association then with the state becomes quite problematic. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we all know that Prince, uh, Prince William is visiting China uh, for the purpose of boosting ties with China recently and um, during his meeting with President Xi Jinping both of them expressed their mutual passion for football. And Xi, Xi, Xi Jinping even said he wanted China to be a strong nation in football. So what do you think of this? And do you think it's a signal of, the, uh, of es establishing this substantially and comprehensive cooperation between UK and China in football? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the interesting things about that, and it, it, was, it was on the radar of um, Tim Vine when I was when I spoke to him, interviewed him a couple of weeks ago. Insofar as they were already the Premier League were already providing a degree of um, support and um, development to the Chinese League, Chinese Super League. So you have a um, a relationship that has a degree of symbolism between heads of state, future head of state, head of state, and you have a degree of um, negotiation and agreement between other entities which have distinct national brands. Chinese Super League and the Premier League, um, and you have a range of interlocutors between them. So permanent undersecretary in the case of, um, is one of the people who Tim knows very well um, in the Foreign Office. That's how, you know, in, in sort of transactional terms, you move from a conversation between you know, senior heads of state to actually a manifestation of that. Now, there's other sim you know, symbolic things that um, can come to pass. I don't doubt that it won't be long before we get a, um, you know, maybe a China England um, international friendly um, at some juncture. Uh, and indeed, I think that the, the the future head of state is head of the football association in this country. Um, honorary head, get yeah, his exact title. But and I say this country, I've forgotten. I've come north again. Sorry, um, that place down south. That gives a you know a particular confluence of the head of state and the head of a sporting organisation that you don't see very often. And yes, it's football and that has a problem in and of itself. Um, but the royal family also are not, you know, uniquely um, saint-like um, in the past. So the, that can perhaps address some of those issues. And, a, you know, the opportunity, the, the, the pure sort of political pragmatism of being a, a politician, and to the extent to which William is, politicised and being associated with sports, just that, you know, I'm sure we'll see it in the next, what, 56 days before the election, um, you know, and whilst Grant may, um, you know, Grant's been working on some research about the influence of sport on the referendum last year, um, with, I won't, you know, they're your conclusions, but, you know, not necessarily hugely conclusive um, factor either way, that doesn't mean politicians won't play to it. 
they're, they're the people who work in the same um, environment. Vine used to work in the Department of Culture, Media and Sport with ja Tessa Jowell and... Um, I've forgotten his name. No, well, Seb Coe, he was working, you know, they were working on the bid document, um, as was um, Phil Townsend, who's the Director of Communications at Manchester United now. These are, the, you know, as individuals, they move between um, government and, the, uh, and sport quite fluidly. Um, and particularly, you know, you see that in the States as well. Listening to you talk, a couple of things, and maybe you just want to elaborate. Yeah. It would be really, it's not diplomacy per se, but it, you know, if you've mentioned at the beginning, I think sports diplomacy and diplomacy is sort of mapping exercise. Yeah. The other's obvious sort of mapping exercise, um, and I don't know if anyone's done it, it's just the networks, you know, in terms of who overlaps with who and talks to who all the time and what's the conduit for the conversation. So uh, uh, the essence of my question is really an observation or a comment, not so much a question, but who meets with who on a regular basis and what do they talk about and where does it go? Um, is there a core, you know, is there a core group of people who I'm not sure there's ever a huge network of these things that, of people who matter. There are people who hang on to the people who matter that make it large, but actually identifying who the, the few people are, or the relatively few at the sort of core of any network would be an excellent, an excellent PhD project, if anyone was looking for one. Um, you know, that's, that's a really, you know, and, and using some of the, well, you know, the, the technology that, that would allow us to do that and literally some of the, you know, the fascinating things that some of my colleagues do with mapping, um, that those kind of networks would be fascinating. I think what's, what's important from my point of view to just sort of add to that is the, when you're talking about networks and you say about what they're talking about, in some senses, I'm perhaps less concerned about what they're talking about particularly as opposed to the way they're talking about it and the message, the, the, the medium of that conversation. So, and I'm not, I don't mind whether it's on, you know, face-to-face -face or email or what have you. That, that's not the medium I'm talking I'm talking about the, the, the level at which they operate and the, um, the fact that they have access to each other as much as the, the, that they can press send on an email or pick up a phone or what have you. And I think that's where the, the diplomacy of it comes much more to bear than the, the subject of, we're talking about a, you know, a World Cup game or some such. You know, the the, um, the European Cup final that were that stopped the G8, the Bayern Munich Chelsea game, um, for what three years ago now, when um, you have a particularly glum-looking Angela Merkel um, when Bayern Munich yeah. lost it on the penalty competition, and, and Obama looking really quizzical as to why would two heads of state, yeah, 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 yeah. Do, you know, have that conversation. Yeah. So, so. On a positive note, having, having uh, you given us a very good answer to the risks, but um, it's whether also sport can replicate what's been going on for decades in terms of cultural diplomacy. A British Council, you know, a member of my family used to work um, for the British Council, and Henry Henry Moore's sculptures would be in the garden yeah. in in uh, what was then um, Persia, um, and. The, the ways in which does the dip diplomatic end of this relationship feel that they can just reproduce cultural diplomacy in terms of sport as culture without it being again a problematic and potentially contested relationship? Um, but do you think that dipl diplomats are having to think outside the box to take account of sport being actually quite different? I mean, you think of who's got the skill set to do this? Seb Co. How many others? Mm, not too sure. Mm. Um, well, I think the, there are people who've been doing this over, you know, anything back to Lord Moynihan of a generation past and to various degrees of success. But the, the um, makeup, for example, if you look at the um, committee membership of the MCC, which is a mapping exercise I've done in very um, um, loose form, when the MCC ran world cricket, you know, they were diplomats. They were, you know, they were, you know, 
it says a lot about who was made up the MCC, but actually they weren't the MCC folk who ran the city, for example. They were the MCC folks who were in the foreign office, or indeed counterpart foreign offices, the India office, um, Dominion's offices at, at various points in the system. So the, um, I do think that diplomats are recognising that sport has, they need to bring it within, and it's not like having a touring um, orchestra or an art exhibition. You know, having a sports team come to visit. The Premier League's um, um, tournament they hold in Southeast Asia, move it around between Thailand and various other places at the beginning of each season. That has a particular, we're here, we're not just fly by night and gone kind of idea. They want to make, they're not just the someone who drop in and off they go. The way that the trade delegation idea works, the Premier League are probably one of the people who are already there for example, so there had to be uh, an event in India before Christmas. Premier League have relationships with the Indian Premier League in its football sense and indeed with its cricket sense already. Now, 90% of them are purely commercial relationships, but actually there are some of the CSR kind of thing. There are some other aspects of sharing of practice. And what, you know, a reflection um, from, from Tim Vine in that regard is, they, the, the people who he was talking to in India were always very surprised that the Premier League are quite happy to share some of this. Now, they have their own interest for sharing this information and their practices and what have you, but actually that there's a um, sort of governance of sorts structure that comes with running a league and that is, it has its faults and its problems and students, uh, and so, uh, students have their problems and faults occasionally, but also players have their problems and faults. That's actually something that you need to be able to embrace. You can't deny that. You know, Indian cricketers have their own faults. NFL players in, the, in America have quite a lot of faults that the NFL, the most successful brand league in the world, seems to be able to ride out. You know, that's problematic. You know, but nevertheless, it is a feature of the world. You can't ignore it because it's, you know, uncomfortable. Yeah. We're going to have to stop there. I know there's people to come in, but... Uh just before we say thank you very much to Simon for sharing this talk.